Today, let's talk about how to deal with problems and hard times in our life. Because you know, right now for you, you might feel like you're living through dark days or frustrating times where things are not really going your way. You're wondering how you're going to manage and cope and deal with all these struggles that you're facing. Whether for you that struggles in, you know, in your relationships, your work, your health, maybe they're in your finances or your spirituality, whatever it might be. Or maybe for you, you're, you've just you know, experienced a tragic event and it's interrupted your life. Maybe a loved one has fallen ill, for example, or they've passed away even, and it's really knocked you down hard. You know, it's left you wondering how is it that you're going to be able to carry on or recover. And having gone through my own fair share of pain and difficulty in the past, I thought today, inshallah, I would share with you five beautifully profound Quranic ideas. So five key things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us in the Quran for us to keep in perspective that have really immensely helped me during my own life tests, which I'm sure can help benefit you too, inshallah. Before I start, you know, some of these things that I'm going to share with you today, you've probably heard before. But like one of my mentors always says, you know, common sense isn't always common practice. So just because you know some of these points, it doesn't necessarily mean that you actually implement them in your life or that you benefit from them, right? Okay, so the first Quranic idea I have for you, inshallah, to keep in perspective when you're dealing with problems and hard times in your life is that everything shall pass. You know, nothing is permanent in life and that includes your hardships as well. Now, I know it can be super frustrating to hear someone tell you that your problems are going to get better in one way or another over time, or that the pain that you're feeling is going to hurt less eventually. Because for you right now, these feelings are really intense, right? You'd rather they get resolved now better than later. For you right now, I understand that the minutes might feel like hours and the days might feel like weeks or months. And maybe for you, you know, you've been in this hardship for, for some time now and you don't feel like anything's developed or got better. You feel like there's still no hope, there's still no way out. But you know, it is a reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants you and I to remember. And that's with good reason. And again, like I said, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He presents this reminder for us in the Quran is so beautifully profound that I think that in and of itself can really help towards healing our hearts, inshallah. Now, as you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he advises us in the Quran to do frequent tasbih of him, right? So to, to, to constantly remember him. Interestingly, if you look at many of those ayats, you'll find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually advises us to engage in dhikr at a, at a specific time of the day. And that's just before the sun rises and just before the sun sets. So you have examples in the Quran where Allah says, uh, you know, Bukratan wa asina, hina tamsoon wa hina tasbahun, wa qabla taru'a al-shams wa qabla al ghurur etc. But why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's drawing our attention to these specific times to engage in dhikr? Well, you know, dawn and dusk are the time where the two greatest things are in the sky, right? So you have the sun and the moon, and they are entering and exiting. So they are the physical manifestation of the change in day and night, right? And by focusing on these times, we're reminded about the sun and the moon's temporary nature, how they're constantly taking one over the other. And with the sun and moon, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's actually calling on the imagery of light and dark. And as you know, in any civilization or culture, you know, lightness and darkness is kind of metaphorically associated with certain things. So lightness, for example, is generally associated with happiness or clarity and hope and blessing, right? And typically the opposite, uh, you know, what's associated with darkness is things like despair or sadness or fear and confusion, for example. And so through these verses, we're reminded of the transient nature of all the things that are good and bad in life as well. So, you know, our joyful experiences, as well as our hardships and tough times, how they are temporary. You know, they come and go just like the moon comes and goes with its lightness and darkness. And you know, at the heart of tasbih is saying subhanallah, right? So declaring the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And interestingly, the word subhanallah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, many times in the Quran, he encourages us to, to mention and to do so at these specific times. It comes from the word sabaha, which means something that floats. And, you know, it's something that stays the same permanently. It doesn't go down. So it stays where it's meant to be perfectly. So in saying subhanAllah, in confessing Allah's perfection and his permanence, you know, this form of tasbih, it reminds us that despite all the changes in our life, whether that's the night and the day, uh, the good times and the tough times, they all constantly come and go 
while Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's the only constant and perfect source of comfort and help and guidance and peace for us, subhanAllah. These verses are a, com you know, a comfort for those of us who are going through tough times, right? It reminds us that just like we have that certainty that when we stand there and we witness the sunrise and the sunset, we're going to witness and experience light and darkness, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we, when we see this for ourselves, it reminds us that surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's going to help, you know, allow us to experience moments of light as well as moments of darkness in our personal life too because neither of them are ever going to last. This is just sunnat al haya And we should also have that certainty that, you know, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, you know, he makes it so that when the sun rises, there is no place that isn't lit by the sun. That subhanAllah, in our own lives, you know, there is no problem, no hardship or challenge or difficulty in your life that is beyond the help and deliverance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he can light up every corner of the earth, then surely he's, you know, he's able to light up any area of you know, our hearts or our lives. And remember, when we declare, subhanAllah, Allah's perfection and his permanence, you're actually declaring his presence in your life, you know, his love for you, his assistance, his blessings, etc., that they never left you and they never will. They're there just the same, regardless of whether you're going through a light period or a dark period in your life right now. Now, in order to really internalize this belief, to make it like a consistent reminder in your daily life in a practical sense, because like we said, common knowledge is not always common practice, I personally suggest that you actually start building a habit of physically looking out of the window every morning and evening, you know, spending that, what, five, 10 minutes watching that sunrise and watching that sunset, witnessing for yourself this kind of interchange of lightness and darkness. And in those few moments, why not engage in tasbih of Allah? You know, say SubhanAllah as he advises in the Quran. And that will remind you of all the lessons that are metaphorically deduced from that wonder. And I promise you, you know, the way that you look at the sunrise and the sunset and the way that you engage in that dhikr saying SubhanAllah, it will never be the same again. Now, many people, you know, they believe that that's a reality, that our troubles in life, are they're just temporary. And they even try to always constantly remind themselves of that. But still, some people might wonder, why does it have to be that way anyway? Why do we have to endure these hardships in our life in the first place? And that's where I want to talk, inshallah, about the second Quranic idea in helping you to better deal with the problems and hard times in your life. And that is to remember that there is meaning in it all. You know, a lot of people, their, their frustrations and their pain from that struggles that they, that they experience, it comes from actually not understanding why these calamities and these difficulties happen to them. You know, they think, is it because I'm a bad person? Is it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he hates me or now he wants to punish me? How can this be happening to me when I'm just trying to be a good person? You know, I thought Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was really loving. So why is he doing this to me? You know, in Surah Al-Ankabut, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, Alif Lam Meem. Did people imagine that they were just going to be left alone and say that they believe and they're not going to be put to a burning test? We absolutely have given burden, you know, burning tests to those who came before them and we will absolutely expose those who are truthful and those who are liars. You know, as Muslims, we know that we've been given a life for purpose, right? That there is this goal, there is this destination that we're, that we're supposed to seek. And essentially that purpose is for us to form a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to become true slaves of His. And what we're actually working towards in our life is towards His company in a place of eternal happiness, in Jannah. Now, in order for us to achieve that, in order for us to prove ourselves somewhat worthy of that priceless, beautiful gift, we need to remind ourselves that our sincerity in our faith, you know, our sincerity in that that desire for that goal, it's naturally going to be tested. So as believers, it's really necessary that we remember that our tests in life, they're not without meaning. They're not without purpose or benefit to you. You know, whether your tests are meant as a form of purification for you or as a form of gaining more reward to add to your scales in the hereafter in order to enter Jannah or for you to, you know, that desire for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be made stronger in you. Whatever reason it might be, you know, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom, for one way, you know, you know, in one way or another, we have to have the certainty that as a believer, they're actually facilitating for us, you know, that achievement of that higher goal and purpose in our life. 
So we need to stop assuming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that he hates us or that he wants to punish us. Realize that we are always benefiting, alhamdulillah. And that's a really important realization because I've experienced a lot of people when they go through hardship and they're told things like, you know, stay steadfast in your prayers and in your dua, for example. Wa'udhu billah, a lot of people say, you know, well, why should I? What has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala done for me? When the truth is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't need you or I. You know, He doesn't benefit from anything that we do. Whether we respond to our tests in a positive or a negative way, it doesn't affect Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's beyond need, you know, in need of us. And so everything that He does and that He decrees for us as a believer is for our own benefit. Now, as for the question of, you know, why do different tests, uh, why are they chosen for different people? And why do they befall people at certain, you know, times in their life? Well, I think it's really beautiful that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He actually started Surah Al-Ankabut. Before start, he started talking about the test, he said, Alif Lam Mim, which as you and I know, no human being actually knows the true meaning of these letters, right? It's as if, you know, we're told that we, will, we might never truly have all the answers to all the questions that we have regarding our tests, right? Because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has full knowledge of everything and he does things, uh, you know, at times that we cannot, uh, we cannot understand or comprehend or fathom. But despite that, I think our hearts can find a lot of rest and a lot of comfort in remembering these things. You know, a common word for calamity or difficulty in the Qur'an is the word musibah. And that comes from asaba, which can mean to hit a target correctly. And that word is strategically used in the Qur'an to suggest to you and I that whatever happens to us, whatever strikes us in life, it's struck on target and on time, just like it was intended. You know, it couldn't have happened to you, it couldn't have happened to anybody but you, and it couldn't have happened at any other time than it did. And as hard or impossible as our tests can sometimes feel, you should remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He only selected your tests and their timings, knowing that you were fully capable of shouldering them. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in Surah Al-Baqarah that He doesn't burden a person with more than they're able to carry. Okay, so how can we go about practically put, uh, you know, remembering these things better, inshallah, when we're going through a hardship? Because the truth is, when we're, when we're going through a hardship, we, we can become so wrapped up in our problems and so absorbed in those really intense negative feelings that we're, uh, we're not always able to focus on these kind of realities that can actually help us, right? Well, although I said that we won't know all of the wisdoms and the benefits in the hardships that we face and, you know, why they occur at certain times in our life, by asking ourselves strategic questions, you know, in a journal where we can actually physically write the answers to during those tough times, I think it can really help direct our focus away from just complaining and wallowing in our troubles to actually reinforcing the beliefs that our problems have a benefit and they have a purpose and that we have the ability to navigate through them. And of course, as a result of you know, changing your perspective and your mindset, you're naturally gonna start feeling a lot better, right? You're gonna become a lot more proactive as well. So you can ask yourself questions like, what can I learn from this problem that I'm facing right now? Or you can ask questions like, how can this difficulty help me to grow and develop as a person? Whether that's emotionally or spiritually or mentally or in your character, your time keeping, your relationships, etc. Ask yourself questions like, what internal or external resources do I have right now or do I have access to that can help me better manage or resolve these difficulties that I'm facing? You know, questions are so powerful. Whatever you ask your brain, it's going to provide you with an answer. So always ensure that you keep those questions that you're asking yourself constructive and positive, inshallah. Okay, so now the third Quranic idea for dealing with problems and hard times in your life to remember is that you're not alone. You know, a lot of the time when we're experiencing hardship or we're going through a tragedy, the easiest thing is just to crawl into bed and hide away and, you know, put the blankets over us and just avoid talking to anyone, right? Because I know the idea of reaching out to people and sharing your burdens, it can feel like you're just going to bring up all those negative, you know, painful feelings of frustration or sorrow, etc., that you'd rather just bury down deep inside. Or it can feel like to talk to people actually requires a lot of effort that you simply just don't have. And some of you might be thinking, you know, what's the point? The people I talk to probably won't even understand, uh, understand, you know, the way I'm feeling or what I'm going through in the first place. 
But you know, the truth is that people have gone through the things that we've gone through before. People have felt the things that we have before. And as harsh as it might sound, we have to realize that nothing that we're actually going through or feeling right now is actually completely unique to us. You know, us human beings, we've been around for hundreds of thousands of years. There's billions of us on the planet right now. So the odds are that every possible problem or tragedy that we're going through in our life, someone's gone through the exact same thing before, or at least very, very similar. And you know, with all the access to the information that we have today and the amazing facilities we have to connect with people all over the world, we don't actually go through things in humanity alone anymore. And I don't personally think that's a bad thing. I think there's a lot of comfort to be found in that. Because, you know, science shows that one of the best ways of dealing and coping with our difficulties to help us feel better, to help us, you know, process things in a more healthy way is through getting social support. Okay, so how can we get the social support that we need then? Well, I would suggest combining two different sources, inshallah. The first is from the people around you. So depending on your circumstance, what you currently feel comfortable with right now, so for you, I would, you know, that might be a family member or a friend, or you might want to get a coach or a counselor, or you might want to attend some type of, uh, you know, support group, whether that's online or offline. So whatever's comfortable for you, uh, it's really important for us to take the first step and to actually connect with people. And as difficult or as daunting as that might sound right now, we have to realize that we're never going to be able to, you know, find the people that we need without actually starting to speak about our experiences and our feelings. So I would suggest that you actually pause this video right now and that you actually make a list of three people that you could reach out to today, inshallah, to start that process. And then actually, at the same time, schedule in specific time that you're gonna do that today. Whether that's you're gonna go and, you know, after work to visit the person in person, or you're gonna, during your class break, you're gonna pick up the phone and speak to them, or maybe when the kids are asleep, you're gonna join a forum or whatnot please do you know, schedule this in and actually make that list for yourself. And then the second amazing source of social support that we have, which many Muslims unfortunately completely overlook, are the role models mentioned to us in the Quran. I'm sure many of you heard me say this many, many times before, but it's amazing how almost half of the entire Quran just consists of stories of the people from the past. And they primarily deal with the Anbiya, the Prophets of Allah, and righteous souls. And you know, the stories Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares with us of their lives, it primarily consists of the problems and hardships that they actually faced. And in those stories, not only are we told about, you know, details on a huge spectrum of difficulties that they faced, but we are given priceless insights and lessons on how they actually overcame them. You know, what thoughts they used to have. Um, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shares their very words with us. What what actions they took, how they felt, etc. And all of this documented within the Quran is for us to draw connection to and relevance to, and then for us to also to grow from and to emulate in order to benefit and succeed, inshallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he actually says in the Quran that this Quran, it explains all things. And that is something that we should never underestimate. You know, regardless of what type of hardship you're going through right now, there is someone you can connect to and relate to in the Quran. Or there are some lessons within it that you can use as an effective guide to get you through these difficulties. And without going off on a tangent, I just want to give you just a few quick glimpses of just how vast the Quran's ability is to connect to anyone. You know, just how relevant it is to each and every one of us, no matter how different our challenges are. Let's say, for example, that you right now, you're currently going through struggles in family, right, with, your, with certain family matters. So for you, let's say specifically it's within your marriage. You know, if you're dealing with an abusive marriage, whether that's mental or emotional or physical, for example, then you have the likes of Asiya and Fir'aun mentioned in the Quran to connect with and to draw relevant guidance from. If you're dealing with a disbelieving spouse, then you have the likes of Lot and Nuh to connect to. If you've lost a spouse, then you have the likes of Muhammad وسلم, to connect to. If you're struggling with difficulties of being physically separated from your spouse, so some type of long distance relationship that you're struggling with, then you have the likes of Ibrahim السلام, to connect with. If you've never, you know, you've never got married, then you have the likes of Isa السلام, and even his mother Maryam السلام, you know, who never married. Do you see where I'm going with this? Okay, let's quickly take one more example. If in your family struggles right now, your struggles actually with your children, 
you know, you should know that there are prophets mentioned in the Quran who never had children, some who had them very late in life, in old age, some who witnessed the death of their children, some who dealt with, you know, really disobedient children or even disbelieving children, subhanAllah. There were prophets mentioned in the Quran who dealt with the separation from their children, whether that was short term or long term. There are those that had to deal with some really serious issues of child rivalry and jealousy, etc. You know, these are just a small, uh, you know, a really small, simple examples relating to some problems that you might be facing with your spouse or your children that are mentioned in the Quran for you to get support from. But there are, of course, so many different problems and so many more different problems and solutions related to uh, not only these relationships, but other fam family dynamics as well. And then there's a whole ocean of problems and solutions presented to us for other issues outside of family. So whether that's emotional conditions, whether that's in our health, challenges in our wealth or, you know, you name it and it's there, subhanAllah. As believers, we should never underestimate the power of what has actually been preserved in the Quran for us in these stories because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he actually calls these stories himself in the Quran, Ahsan al-Qasas, that they are the best of stories. So, you know, these are the best of stories that are narrated to us because they have the most, number one, they deal with the best of creation and because also they have the most powerful and beneficial lessons in helping us to practically overcome all of our struggles in our day-to-day -day life. And in order to really practically utilize this, you know, divine source of social support, I really highly recommend that you specifically block out time, you know, maybe even just one hour a week to study the lives of the prophets and the righteous souls that are mentioned in the Quran. And you will find that it has a profound impact, positive impact, inshallah, in your life, especially when you're going through hard times. The fourth Quranic idea I have for you for dealing with problems and hard times in your life is to keep gratitude alive. Now, I know you've probably heard this a million times before, but I'm gonna say it again anyway. No matter how many hardships you're experiencing right now, no matter how heavy those burdens and challenges can feel right now, there are so many more blessings to be grateful for in your life. You know, a lot of you are familiar with Surah Al-Rahman, right? And we're aware, we're aware of that reoccurring question that Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala He asks throughout that Surah. He says, فَبِأَيِّ آلَاءِ رَبِّكُمَا تُكَذِّبَانِ Right? And many people, they translate that as, which of the favors of your Lord will you deny? But in Arabic, interestingly, favor is ni'am or fada'il, not ala. So it's not really an accurate translation. Ala is actually something that gets your attention. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is repeatedly telling us in that surah that he has placed so many amazing things around us that are begging our attention, that are screaming for us to look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did for us that we're not actually paying attention to. It's basically how, like, highlighting for us, you know, just how far away we are from acknowledging just how actively involved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in our lives, good or bad times. And it's an important reminder because when we're going through difficulties, many of us immediately think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has abandoned us, right? Or that he's taken away our blessings. So we ask questions like, where is Allah when I need him? Why isn't he helping me right now? And when we're reminded by people to be grateful, many people say, you know, grateful for what? When the reality that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's always there and he's constantly giving us, regardless of whether we acknowledge it and appreciate it or not. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the same surah that everything in the skies and the earth, they're, they're asking of him. And in Arabic, there's two types of asking. There's the conscious asking and there is being in need of him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us that everything in the heavens and the earth are in constant need of him. So he's always constantly giving including to those who are ungrateful and even those who disbelieve in him. You know, when we're questioning where Allah is, why he isn't helping, questioning, you know, what there is to be grateful for, we have to realize that our very lungs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted us with, uh, you know, are, is taking in the air that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also gifted us with and asking permission to fill it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that we're going to use that in an ungrateful way, he still grants that for you and I as a favor. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he doesn't owe us anything. He doesn't benefit from giving us, yet he still gives. And that's because, you know, as his, the name of the surah suggests, it reminds us that he is Ar-Rahman. So there's always so much more to be grateful for when we're going through our hardships. Okay, so how can we practically go about starting to become more actively grateful in our life then? You know, especially since we said that during our times of struggle, 
when we're in that eye of the storm, all our thoughts and our efforts and our emotions, they're absorbed in that hardship. So it's very hard to refocus. Well, let me share something very profound with you from the life of Prophet Musa that's mentioned in the Quran. You know when Musa, he left Egypt with Bani Israel and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed them that miraculous escape through the Red Sea and he drowned Fir'aun in the Red Sea with his army. Bani Israel, they found themselves facing a new challenge, right? They found themselves in the middle of the desert with no food, shelter, water, and Musa now needed to address his population on how to handle this crisis that they were facing. And what's amazing in this khutbah is that he didn't talk about patience. He actually said, make mention of Allah's favor on you now that he has rescued you from Fir'aun and his entire legacy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he narrates to us that khutbah and he, you know, he tells us that Musa then starts to mention that how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved them from being humiliated by Fir'aun and his people, how he saved him from, uh, saved them from the massacre that they used to do to their sons, allowing their women to live, etc. So Musa alayhi salam, in these verses, in this khutbah that he's giving, he tells his people to be grateful for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favors. But interestingly, they're not what we would normally classify as favors, right? Humiliation and massacre is not what we would think, you know, like food and clothing and cars, for example. What he's actually telling his people is not to overlook how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rescued them from all their previous hardships. And from that, we actually learn that the first step in gratitude isn't necessarily to always straight away look at the good things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is doing right now, which can be difficult, like we said, in a hardship. But the first step is actually being grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by remembering the terrible things that have already happened that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he already saved you from. You know, Musa is telling them that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could save them from the clutches of the strongest dynasty in the world without even an army, that he can surely help them overcome what they're facing at that moment. So when you and I are going through hardship and when we're overwhelmed by the stress and the pain of it all, we can start to develop our levels of gratitude by simply just starting to recall all the past hardships that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually got us through. You can make a physical list of this on your journal. Keep one page of your journal specifically for, you know, writing down every time that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has saved you from a test. He's allowed you to come out of the end of that dark tunnel. And this is going to help you to retain perspective on the temporary nature of hardships, like we mentioned, is really important. And it's also going to help you to maintain a lot of hope and confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Now, some people might be thinking, okay, well, I know it's good to be grateful for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me in the past and try to focus on the good that he's doing right now for me. But how is that exactly going to help me with this current problem I have? How is it going to solve my current issue? Well, you know, Musa, when he was addressing Bani Israel in that desert, he went on to say, remember the moment your master declared that if you were to be grateful, and the Arabic here, by the way, actually suggests that even if you show a tiny bit of gratitude, subhanAllah, then I will absolutely increase you and increase you and increase you. Now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala isn't saying increase you, but increase you in what? Allah doesn't actually specify. He doesn't limit it because he knows that when you're going through a crisis, there's a lot of things that you're going to need to be increased. You know, whether that's your strength and your conviction or extra protection or extra blessings, etc. You name it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala beautifully promises us to increase us in all the good things we have without limit when we simply show a tiny bit of gratitude during our hardships, subhanAllah. Now to build this grateful attitude as an actual habit in our life that we can, you know, that we're consistently engaged in, that can really help us go through our hardships successfully, I'd actually suggest that every morning you ask yourself, what three things am I most grateful for in my life today? And you know, really to help you develop that into a habit, I would say set some triggers up in your life. So maybe this question is something that you've written on a post-it note and you stick it up on your fridge or your mirror that you look at every day physically, or maybe you can write it down and set it as a background image on your phone or your laptop. And you can even um, try to set this up as a habit when you engage in your day-to-day -day activities as well. So maybe every time you get in the car, you start the habit before turning on the engine to ask yourself that question so it becomes a trigger. Or maybe if you live in an apartment floor, you know, you can, um, apartment building, you can you know, set the trigger for yourself that every time I enter the lifts 
I'm going to ask myself that question, for example. Or that you're going to set that question as an alarm on your phone. So these are just ways to develop gratitude and to make it a habit through daily triggers. And that's really important, and I'll tell you why. Because you know Shaitan, he made a promise that's recorded in the Qur'an for us. And what was that? That you will find them what? You will find most of them ungrateful. So his goal is actually to make us ungrateful. But how? By making us forget. And that is the only power that Shaitan has over us. وَمَا أَنْسَانِيهُ إِلَّا الشَّيْطَانُ أَنْ أَذْكُرَهُ You know, Shaitan, he knows how powerful it is to be consistently grateful in your life. And so this is a consistent battle, a conscious battle that we have to engage in every single day, inshallah. And shukr and gratitude, by the way, isn't just this external act of, you know, on the tongue that we just say, alhamdulillah. This is something that really requires us to engage our hearts and our souls so that our tongues feel compelled to say it. So this is something that we have to work on and only we ourselves know if we're truly genuine or not. The fifth and the last thing to keep in mind, inshallah, when you're going through difficulties and hardship is that small progress is still progress. You know, when we're going through tough times, we naturally want a way out. We want something to change. And when it doesn't, we feel stuck. We feel stuck in our sadness and depression. We feel stuck in our stress and frustration or that trauma. And we feel really powerless. And that feeling of being stuck is a source of pain in and of itself, subhanAllah. Because we have a natural disposition, a fitra, an inclination towards this desire to grow and develop. But we need to realize that even though we may be in a difficulty that's beyond our control, we can overcome that painful feeling of being stuck, inshallah, by simply asking ourselves each and every day what three simple things we can set for ourselves and get done to help us move forward in life. And, you know, in setting those three small goals and in moving forward, you're going to feel far more connected with yourself again. It's going to help you to restart your engines to get you moving forward. And that exercise of taking this small, consistent action is actually going to give you that sense of progress that you need. It's going to help you to feel a sense of achievement every day. And that's going to lead you to gaining more momentum, inshallah, as you're trying to find your feet. And as you start to implement this three-day goal habit, you're naturally going to gain a lot more perspective in life, inshallah, and you're going to feel a lot more engaged in the life. Now, for you, those three things might be really, really simple because you might be in a really dark place right now. It might just be simply to get washed and dressed in the morning or to re read a few pages of a book or take a walk or maybe even just to smile at the next person you come across that day. And that's okay, you know, that's going to help you, inshallah. You know, small progress is still progress. And you know, you taking care of your body by having that shower, by the way, or nourishing it with good food, isn't wrapped without reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You feeding that mind that you've been gifted with by reading those couple of pages isn't without reward. And that's the beauty of Islam, isn't it? That it's not all about the fancy big things, it's about you know quality over quantity. So the fact that you chose to smile at someone when your own heart is breaking inside, do you think that's not without reward? You know, in continuing to maintain faith and do good deeds, we benefit ourselves in terms of earning more reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he actually says in Surah Ankabut, if we revisit that surah, and those who have faith and do good deeds, meaning even during their hardships, we will bury away their sins and compensate them with the best of what they used to do. So basically, if during your difficulties in life, you maintain faith and you do good deeds, not only is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying that he's going to erase all your sins, but he's actually going to take the very best deed that you've done in your entire life, which might only be one thing perhaps that you weren't even aware of, and he's going to actually reward your entire life according to that one deed. So for example, let's say you did one amazing prayer in your life and the rest were not that great. He's actually going to reward you as though you prayed all your prayers your entire life like you prayed that one, subhanAllah. So you know, don't stop doing good. Starting with yourself and then with others as well, inshallah, because you can't serve from an empty cup like they say. So three simple daily goals, inshallah. Okay, so whenever you're going through problems and hardships in your life, please always remember that they will pass, that there's meaning to it all, that you're never alone. Remember to keep gratitude alive and that small progress is still progress, inshallah. Now, if you benefited from this video, then please do share it with all those that might benefit as well. And don't forget to subscribe to Quran Rehab and hit the bell icon as well so that you can be notified every time free training videos like this is released. 
And I hope, inshallah, that this video, as all my other videos as well, they help you to remember that when you truly transform your personal relationship with the Qur'an, then you can truly transform your entire life for the best, inshallah. And you can start living what I call a Qur'an lifestyle. Until next time, inshallah, take care. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.